Well, good morning. It's good to see so many of you here this morning and folks in the parking lot. If you're out in the parking lot, would you let us know you're watching with delay? It's like a 15 second delay. I don't think I can wait that long. His hair is not growing back. I'm just saying. So it's good to see you guys this morning. Today we're going to talk about perspective, and I want to tell you a couple things about men. Ladies, this might let you in. Men, you may not know you feel this way, so I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. Um, here's what I've discovered about men. Uh, at some point, every man feels like giving up at something, whether it's work or relationships or home or something they've always done. They just... They get to the point where they're just like, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I believe there's two things that happen. And a lot of men are hard on themselves. You may or not realize this. A lot of men never feel like they do enough. They're not sure who they are. They're not sure what they're supposed to do. But they know they're supposed to do a lot of it. So they do it as fast as they can. You know, and, they, and they're just kind of lost. Other men did that for a while and didn't find success. So they've just given up. They've just said, well, I'm just... Not going to try anymore. And we see both extremes. We all know somebody who just, like, we would probably say they're lazy or a good for nothing or whatever. It's somebody who at one time tried and then finally decided it's just not worth it. And then the other people who are driven and can't stop and never feel like they measure up and maybe grew up in a house with a dad or a mom that, that, no matter what they did, there was one more thing they needed to do in order for them to be happy. And so they lived their life always trying to do one more thing, thinking maybe this next thing will be the thing that does it. And if we're not careful, what will happen is we move into the wrong perspective and we think about things the wrong way. And so today I'm going to talk about choices about perspective. Now, do you know what this is? I know what this is, because I use this quite often. Uh, some people call this a power sniffer. I like that. That's my favorite term for this. And let me tell you why I bought one of these. Because my perspective on whether or not a breaker actually turned off power or not was very wrong often. The worst time being one time I turned off the breaker that said power to the kitchen when I was redoing my backsplash with tile and I was then taking a wet sponge to the tile to clean the grout. And as I did it, it caught the side of one of the outlets that was on that wall. And I quickly discovered that my perspective was wrong as power went through my right arm and then through my belly because the counter was wet. It was very exciting. It changed my perspective very quickly about that socket. Now, I cannot hold a candle to your husband, Bob, because Bob actually has a story where a guy said you need to go change that 440 breaker out. And it was one that you use a tool to... But the guy didn't tell him about the tool. So Bob went up and grabbed the 440 breaker and found himself on his back. And then he did it again. That is an absolutely true story, isn't it? So I can't hold a candle to some of the perspective... Of some of the men in our church. But I will tell you that this helps a lot to give me perspective. It helps me to know, is my perspective about electricity right? Listen, when we go into God's word, when we look at the Bible, we discover what real perspective is. Because the world is always trying to say, this is the perspective you should have. Some of you, your childhood and the way you grew up and what even your parents said to you. Can I tell you something? Some of your parents were wrong. I know that's a shocker to some of you. But they said things to you like, I'm not happy with you because you're not doing enough. Or I'm not this. And some of you still walk around with that perspective. You think, I'm never good enough. I never do enough. I'm never satisfied. I can never be happy. I can never, because of what you learned as a child. Your perspective is wrong. And that's the reason. Between the world and that and what somebody else may have told you, we've got to go back to the Bible 
to regain a proper perspective about life. This ancient book that is not just a book, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit uses this book to remind you and to inspire you and to show you what's really going on. Because we don't always see the right way, but God does. God does. And today we're going to look at this idea of scarcity or abundance. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about fear of faith. And then we're going to talk about if we're going to focus on our problems or on Christ. I hope if you're a hard worker that this sermon, if you're an overworker, that this sermon will take some pressure off of you. You'll understand. And if you're one of those who's given up and you no longer keep trying, maybe you, you fail on purpose, that this message will help you to gain better perspective. So the first thing is scarcity or abundance mindset scarcity or abundance mindset this has actually become a psychological principle now the bible's talked about this for years that's why the bible constantly talks about reaping and sowing and and you can't reap unless you sow by the way you have to sow in every season if it's a drought season you still have to sow you still have to work the farm if you're going through a hard time in life you still have to be obedient to what god wants you to do we tend to in the hard times say well i'm not doing anything because we have a scarcity mindset. I'm going to read this verse and then talk about toilet paper. Here we go. In Matthew 14, you've got the disciples. And they look at Jesus and they say, listen, Jesus, we've got all these people here. They're hungry. Send them home. Now, the disciples wanted them to go home for a couple of reasons. Number one is the disciples were figuring, hey, there's some good Taco Bells close by here. And we can go eat. So send these people home. And then we can make a run over to the Chick-fil-A. Because we know that's Jesus' food, right? And so, and so he said, you know, go do that. And um, uh, maybe it was Arthur Treacher's because there was more fish back then. So, so Jesus says to them, they say, hey, send them home. And Jesus looks at them and goes, no, 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 you feed them. So imagine being a disciple and Jesus is like, you feed them. So the disciples realize they don't have very much. Listen to what they say next. They say, we, thanks for turning off. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. Bring them here to me, he answered. Now, now listen, I'm sure the disciples were thinking we're getting ready to do Sam's Club taste menu. We're going to get a little toothpick. We're going to cut these fish into five or six thousand pieces. And we're going to give everybody a taste. Here you go. I'm sure that's what they were thinking. Why? Because our perspective is there's not enough. There's not enough. What are we going to do? We don't have enough. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough love. By the way, some single people struggle with, I don't have enough relationship. Some of us struggle with, I don't have enough emotional energy. Some of us struggle with, I don't have enough food. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough. And when you think that way and your focus is on what you lack, you tend to make Bad decisions. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. Notice where Jesus even focuses on. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. By the way, this word in the Greek is really cool. It's the idea of grazing so much that the cows or the sheep are full. It's a button-loosening meal. Men are hoping for that today, by the way. People say, what do men want for Father's Day? That and most of them want to be left alone. That's pretty much the two things that I get. By the way, there's actually a song. Did you see that song on Facebook where the guy basically says, oh, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that. No, I want to do that. By the way, uh, I'm glad so many of you are here today because many times the men's request is, I just want to stay home. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. A few months ago, everybody felt suddenly that they needed toilet paper. I have no idea why. But here's what happened. As people went to the store and there was less toilet paper, people bought more toilet paper. Because they thought, we're going to be out of toilet paper, so we need toilet paper. By the way, if you have trouble with toilet paper, let me know. I'll give you this roll. So, so, you know, they said, we don't have enough. And so they bought more. And what happened? It created a problem for everyone. Listen, 
when you refuse to share your gifts, when you refuse to share financially what God has given you, when you refuse to share your love because you just have had too much, when you refuse to go out of your way to be a blessing to others because you just had too much, you create a problem for other people. God created you with gifts. God created and blessed you, not so you could keep it for yourself, but so that you could bless others. But when you get in a scarcity mindset, you hang on to things. Did you know a lot of the PPE, a lot of the masks that they brought out of storage from the government were rotted? You know why? Because they didn't use them. Listen. If you try to just hold on to what God's given you, all it's going to do is get rotten. You say, God, I'm going to share what you've given. Now listen, I'm not talking about doing so much that you're exhausted. Some of you need better boundaries. But you need to do what God called you to do. No more, no less. God, what have you called me to do? Listen to what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. No, trust in the Lord, that by the way, that word means to take refuge. With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So here's your first prayer. Lord, by faith, I believe you will provide for me. Henry Ward Beecher said this, every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of it with the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. So which one are you going to pick up today? You have a choice. You have a choice. Number two. Focus on fear or faith. Sometimes men, if we're honest, we feel like we're not getting far enough. We drive that way, don't we? We take trips that way. Oh, didn't get where I was supposed to get today. And we set our, bound, our, our level to, and then we're frustrated when we don't get there. And we're not able to enjoy the journey. That's why we sit in the car and go, get in the car! Instead of enjoying time with the very people that we're taking to church. I always thought that was funny. Sit in the car and honk at people and yell at them to get in the car. We're going to love Jesus. Matthew 14 tells us about our lives. And the boat was a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. You ever feel that way? You're buffeted, you're beat up. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw them walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Time out. So during this time, one of the fishermen's tales back then was that before you died on the ocean, basically what they considered the grim reaper, you would see him. And so they thought, oh, we've been buffeted, we've been buffeted. Here comes the grim reaper. We're all going to die. That kind of adds a little excitement to the story, doesn't it? And imagine what Jesus looked like with the wind blowing, wearing one of those cool robes that they wore back then. Hair growing in the wind. Beard probably shaking. I don't know how much of a beard he had. George, he might have had a little one. He might have had a big one. We're not sure. And then it says, Jesus, listen, listen, immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And I love that who I consider the ADD disciple, the guy who blurts. If you're a blurter, you should relate to this disciple. If you've ever said something and right after you said it, thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that. That's Peter. Here he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come on the water. Come, he said. All the disciples are in the boat. They scream, it's a ghost, look out. Jesus says, it's me. And Peter's like, cool, I want to do that. Peter was the one who went out of his way. Peter was the one who had courage to get out of the boat. Why? Because he knew where Jesus was and he wanted to be where he was. Listen, when you're struggling in the waves and the wind, cry out to Jesus. Say, I need you. Ask him for this courage. Psalms 3, 6, I will not fear no ten, those tens of thousands assail me on every side. I don't know if you felt that way before. David definitely did. I'm sure his fight with Goliath felt that way. In Hebrews 11, it says, Faith is confident in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then it says, By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. And here's the two parts of this. Paul's saying, uh, uh, the author of Hebrews is saying to us, Listen, 
Faith is confidence in what could happen. It's not what's happening right now. Have you ever had a situation where it feels hopeless? You ever had a situation where you thought things are not going to work out? Paul addresses that right here and says, Faith is understanding that God's going to take care of it even though everything looks terrible right now. And then he points us to the heavens. Look at what God's done. Can I tell you a little secret? When you're feeling overwhelmed and buffeted by life, when you feel fear instead of faith, go outside. Quit sitting and soaking. Go outside and look up at the stars. I grew up in South Florida. We didn't see stars. We saw one or two. I thought that was the way the sky looked. Did you know that? It's true. I grew up, I remember the first time going to the mountains and thinking, wow, these mountains must be a lot closer to the stars. Go outside. Why? Because when you realize and thank God for what he's made, you realize he can take care of you. Plus, it gets your focus off you. If you focus on you all the time, you're going to struggle. If you focus on you all the time, you're not going to get out of the boat. By the way, the rest of the disciples are hiding in the bottom of the boat. Peter, at this point, is focusing on Jesus. Oh, but that's getting ready to change. Lord, I choose to walk in this moment by faith, not fear. I love what Dale Carnegie says. If you want to conquer fear, don't sit at home and think about it. Go out and get busy. Some of you, when you get discouraged, you need to go to Publix. What? Well, you probably have shopping to do anyway. Put on your mask and go get some almond milk or whatever you get. I don't know. Get, just get out of the house. Go down by the river. Let God speak to you as you realize he created all things. And he can take care of whatever you think is a big problem. Guess what? The universe is much bigger than whatever you're dealing with. And guess what? He created that. So he can walk you through whatever you're dealing with. Don't be afraid. Number three, we can dwell on our problems or on Christ. You can focus so much on your problem that you miss life. Did you know that? I was in Miami. This tell you how old it was. I had a paper map. And I had an exit in North Miami. I had to go on and I'll never forget. I, I, I was supposed to be at the exit, supposed to be at the exit, supposed to be at the exit. So I said, oh, I must have missed it. I picked up my map. As I picked up my map, I passed the exit. Took me 35 minutes to get back to where I needed to turn. Why? Because I was so focused on my problem, I missed the exit. Dads, you can be fo so focused on what's wrong in your life right now, you do not spend time with your children. So focused on the driver in front of you that you don't enjoy the people in your car. So focused on a problem at work that you don't realize all the people that God has blessed you with in your life. Back away from your problem, focus on Christ, and he will help you to love the people around you. Then Peter got out of the boat, he walked on water, and he came towards Jesus. That is awesome. None of the other disciples can say this. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Another reason I think he's ADD. He's out there, he's like, Jesus, 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 squirrel. When he saw the winds and the wave, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. By the way, Jesus could have calmed the storm ahead of time. Most of the amazing things you're going to do in your life are going to be during tough times or because of tough times. Don't underestimate how God can use a storm in your life to make you stronger and to use you for what's next. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Do you realize how close Jesus was? If he could immediately. What happened? Peter for a moment thought he was doing it on his own. He focused on himself. He focused on his fear. He focused on his problems. He realized he couldn't do it and said, save me. And Jesus immediately did that. And then he scolds him a little bit. He says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I can just hear Peter coughing through that whole conversation. You have little faith. <laughs> Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you're the son of God. Jesus could have calmed the storm ahead of time, but he didn't. 
He had a lesson to teach. He could calm the storm in your life in a moment. Instead, he wants you to learn what you're supposed to learn in the storm. By the way, he never fails you. He just gives retakes. So feel free to fail this lesson. He'll give you another one. Isn't that exciting? You might want to learn it this time. Father, I choose to focus on your blessings. I remember when my kids were little and we'd swim in the pool. I remember Kyle was a little skittish coming off the side of the pool. And I'd stand there and go, Kyle, jump. Kyle, jump. Kyle, jump. And Kyle. Now, you got to realize, if you've seen Kyle lately, Kyle's over six foot tall now. If he jumped on me now, that would be the end of me. You guys would have the funniest funeral ever. Kyle, jump. Kyle, jump. Kyle. Finally, Kyle would get up the courage and he'd grab onto me. Lydia, however, I could be facing this way. And all of a sudden, something would hit me in the head. And it was Lydia. She trusted her dad no matter where he was, no matter how deep he was in the pool. I could be in eight feet of water and she'd jump off the side of the pool. And I'd have to hold her up as I drown to get her back to the side of the pool. But she trusted in a way that we should trust Christ. Because he can always hold you up. And so no matter what you're going through today, I encourage you. Don't. Make your perspective about what's going on around you. Make your perspective back to God. What are you showing me in your words? Spend some time in your Bible every day refocusing, asking God to give you the right perspective, spending time in prayer, being thankful for the people around you, even that person that aggravates you sometimes. Wives, that was for you too. Grandparents, that was for you too. Have that one grandkid that drives you crazy. Lord, thank you for their energy. We don't always see things the right way, but God does. So we have to check our perspective. Scarcity or abundance, fear or faith, problems are on Christ. Ask for his perspective. If you're here today or watching online or listening in the parking lot and you want to give your life to Christ today, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. You can call me, text me, email me, talk to me after the service. Be glad to talk to you about that. The truth, though, for all of us is most of us, men and women, struggle with one of these things. So maybe take one of these points, one of these verses today, and put it on your refrigerator or put it in your car. There's a prayer at the end of the service you can pray this week just to remind you of how God wants to give you a new perspective. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for today. Father, I pray that you would bless each one here, that you would bless each moment that we have. Lord, I do. I'm thankful for dads. I'm thankful for a father who didn't always get it right, but he taught us so much. And Father, I know for many here, maybe they did not have good dads, good examples, but they had someone in their life who acted as a dad. So I thank you for those godly examples of what a good father is. Lord, bless each one today. In Jesus' name, amen.